hear me in the back? I can usually fill this room. Hopefully today's no exception. Thanks for coming on this dreary winter morning and risking all life and limb as we get the huge ice storm they're predicting. Uh, I uh, want to uh, thank the organizers for setting this up and inviting me to talk. It's a great opportunity. I'm really excited about this topic, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate uh, being allowed to talk about something beyond that's a little bit outside my pure academic research. Uh, and I want to thank also give a shout out to the uh, Kalamazoo Electric Vehicle Association, local group of enthusiasts who've uh, shared a lot of information and supported me in this uh, in this uh, avocation the last decade or so. What we have. We have uh, a worldwide transportation system that is really remarkable these days. Uh, we take it for granted, but we can, we can travel all over the world, land, water, through the sky, and it's all powered by, virtually all powered by uh, oil, crude oil, petroleum products that are derived from crude oil. Now we take it for granted, and it's very familiar. Today, I want to end. It's been a great boon to civilization, if you, if you really think about it. Yeah, 150, 120, 150 years ago, there was nothing like it. And it's really changed how we live and how, how, how the world is. And we, what I want to do today, though, is talk about an alternative way of powering the transportation system. And I think it's uh, a very interesting application of scientific principles, but it's at the same time something practical and familiar. So I hope it'll be interesting to you. What I want to do is, uh, my, my objective is to really explain how it works, how, this, uh, how using electricity to power transportation works in very basic terms. Uh, so I'm going to compare and contrast the two ways of powering transportation, the, the fossil fuel burning and using electricity, stored electricity directly. So I'll spend more time talking about the electricity side because that's less familiar. But all, all, all through this, in, in, we're, we're thinking in the background that we're, we're talking about uh, how it's different from our, our current system and what's familiar. So let's see if I can do that. All right, so it's going to be back practical and down to earth. I'm going to try to keep the science straightforward, um, not too involved. And it's not going to be wildly speculative. Maybe in the year 3000, it'll be more practical to put people in pneumatic tubes or we'll have flying cars. This is not about that. This is about what we can do pretty much right now. And here's the outline of how I'm going to approach it. I'm going to start with an introduction and, and set, the, set the groundwork, try to give a little bit of context, a uh, little bit of history, try to define the terms I'm going to use. If I slip into jargon, I'll try to uh, make sure that I've defined all those things to begin with. I'm going to start the, the core of the talk with the technology that really makes this possible, and that's the, the relatively lightweight, robust storage batteries, electric storage batteries, that have been developed most recently that make, you know, make this laptop work without a cord, makes your phone work all day. It's, it's again, it's, it's, not, it's not an unfamiliar technology, but it's important, very important for what we, for what, for making this transportation, electrified transportation possible. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. That'll, a lot, that'll require us to talk about concepts of power and energy and efficiency, very, very foundational, very fundamental topics in physics and other sciences. Um, that'll give us an opportunity also to talk about bringing in the environmental impact and the economic factors. We'll kind of slide into more practical issues as we go along, um, how this actually works. 
how you can understand as a, as a driver, as a consumer, as a customer, how this will be the same if we drive this way, how it will be different. And then I'll look at a little bit into the future. Going beyond just regular cars, you'll see I'll start with regular cars. Uh, but then I'll go a little bit beyond that, and then I'm going to try real hard to leave time for uh, discussion and, and questions at the end. Uh, my tendency is to go over long on something I'm really excited about. So <laughs> if I talk a little fast, that's why. I apologize for that. Uh, there's too much. There's too much to talk about I, uh, to fit into 50 minutes. So I'll skip some things. I'll gloss over some things. Keep track of your questions. Uh, I might ask you to, to leave your questions to the end, so that if people do have to leave because because it's frozen up north or whatever, they can do that at the end. But but we'll have I'll be willing to stay longer if we want to talk about uh, issues that I glossed over along the way. So unless it's really urgent, which is okay, uh, I'll ask you to save save questions to the end, and hopefully we'll have time for that. Okay, so diving right into the. Uh, Abbreviations and the lingo. EV is probably a term you've heard, most of you by now. It's a little ambiguous because it just means electric vehicle, and there are different ways that vehicles can be electric, and it's confusing for a lot of people because there are also <coughs> hybrid vehicles which blend both the the gasoline internal combustion and electric motors in the same vehicle. Okay, so technically, hybrids can be an electric vehicle, can be considered electric vehicles also, but it's very different from a pure electric vehicle. So I like to, I like to keep this straight in my mind, even though I might use EV a lot. If I really want to be careful, I use battery electric vehicle to talk about not a hybrid, all battery power, just electricity used for propulsion. And then to confuse things even a little bit further. Some, the original hybrids, all of their energy came from burning gasoline or other fuels. But they had batteries on board, so in principle, you could have charged the battery by taking some energy from the grid. The first generation of Priuses and stuff, like, you couldn't do that just because they didn't provide that option. But now there are cars that do that as well, so that you can get some of the, so the source of the energy can come from different places, okay? So, uh, if that's confusing, it's probably not a big deal, but if you have questions about that, I'm happy to, to try to clear that up. And I'll try to be very clear in my terminology. What I'm going to be talking about, because of limited time, I'm going to be focusing on the battery-only vehicles most of the time today, uh, all the time today, technically. But uh, these... These, both of these are grouped into plug-in electric vehicles sometimes to distinguish a category where you can get some energy from the electric grid. I know it's complicated. The last term that I might slip in is ICE or ICE. It's just a quick way of saying internal combustion engine. Let's just sometimes uh, say how primitive they are. It's like the ice age. <laughs> but uh, just a little, now just a little history. Uh, a little context. The, the principle of an electric motor is not new. The principle of a battery is not new. In fact, even the principle of an electric vehicle, a car, is not new. When the car, when automobiles were first invented, there were a lot of electric vehicles. This is a, an ad from the Saturday Evening Post, 1910. Perfectly good, uh, commercially available electric vehicle. You could go on the roads, public roads. Uh, 15 miles an hour, 100 mile range. Back then, 15 miles an hour was great. Okay, it was still a, it was a, a great thing. And you might notice that there are ladies in there. That was a definite marketing uh, angle for the electric vehicles back then. Uh, you didn't have to crank the, the thing to get started. It was a very attractive option for, for ladies and other people. <coughs> In the early part of the century, you know, a third of all the cars were electric, but that decreased over time for a lot of fascinating reasons. Uh, Henry Ford, the, elect the invention of the electric starter, lots of reasons that internal combustion took over, as we know. 
by the time the depression, Great Depression came, uh, the last electric car companies went out of business. All the electric car, all the cars were gasoline or diesel powered. We had, we continued to use electricity for transportation, where we could string wires overhead. It's, most cities had streetcars and trolleys that were electrified, and the, uh, where's the subway and the L in uh, Chicago are electric, where they don't need batteries. You can, uh, you can run wires or run the, or supply the electricity to the track. Uh, that works fine for, for certain situations. And we still have an interurban train that goes, it's called the uh, South Shore Line that is totally electric. Many of you may have experienced that. And even the regular train, train, the Amtrak trains, the passenger trains that run on the tracks, they're really electric vehicles, except that they have an onboard diesel generator that provides the electricity. Okay, so we get into the science. Uh, I want to talk about energy. Energy is the basis for all, for all this transportation. Um, energy comes in many forms. Electricity is a very flexible form. You can use it to heat, you can use it for light, you can distribute it easily, and you can use it for motors, for, for motion. So it's really attractive in that sense. It's clean at the, at the end. Uh, it's not so easy to store, however. You can avoid the storage, like I said, by energizing train tracks or running uh, power lines through your whole route, but then you're stuck with that route. Okay, and this is America after all, we like our freedom, and so I'm going to talk about a more familiar kind of personal transportation where you just have tires on the road, you can drive anywhere you want. That requires storage batteries, that requires you to keep, have your energy on board with you, or have your in, or energy in the form of uh, fuel in a tank that you can, you can burn as you go along. All right, so like I alluded to earlier, the key to this then, if you want to get away from internal combustion, is to find a way to store a significant amount of electrical energy on your vehicle and take it with you. So that's the storage battery. Now, uh, in order to talk about how storage batteries work, it's really interesting. Uh, I'm gonna do it from the sort of the physicist point of view. I'm not a chemist, so I apologize to any chemists in the crowd. I know I saw a few, if I get it wrong. Here's a, just a, a, a diagram of what you need to have in your electric vehicle to make this work, just to give you the, 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 the big picture. And I made the battery pack big because that's a big part of electric vehicles, as we'll see. It's not only really important conceptually and fundamentally, it actually ends up taking up a lot of space and mass, as you see. So the, the main storage of energy is here in a battery pack, and it's separate from the ordinary 12-volt battery system that you would have in your internal combustion engine car. We still have that in our electric cars to run things like uh, radio and the headlights, but this is a totally separate electrical system that's much higher voltage, much higher energy capacity because the demands for moving the vehicle is, are bigger than the, the energy required to run your stereo. So these boxes here are other power electronics boxes, but they're all the connections basically, until you get over here, all these connections are just wires. So that gives you a lot of flexibility, it's easy to do. There are two different ways to charge the battery that we'll discuss later on. Um, and there's a lot of computers to make sure everything's working, uh, taking care of the temperature range, keeping the battery in a certain temperature range is important. So this is both cooling and heating, possibly. But then you have a motor that's connected to the axle and the wheels, and that's what you need. It's pretty straightforward. Lithium-ion batteries, the kind of batteries that we're going to be talking about, are so important that the developers just recently won the Nobel Prize for, for developing that. So it's, this is 
very timely. It's been recognized as could possibly a very important, even disruptive technology. So let's talk about how that works. Uh, the details can be different, but uh, this is sort of a, one of the one of the possible reactions that is used. It's a typical one. It's a reaction where you have uh, energy released if it goes in this direction. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the only difference between the left side and the right side is where this little Li is. So lithium has moved from uh, being sort of attached to carbon to being sort of attached to a cobalt oxide. And when that lithium moves, or the, the result of that is a release of energy. There's more, there's, there's extra energy available here that is, that is released when this reaction occurs. The trick is that if you keep the carbon and the cobalt oxide separate, What actually has to move is a positively charged lithium ion and a negatively charged electron when that happens. So you keep those separate. Here I've illustrated that with a carbon like graphite anode here and this, this cobalt oxide cathode over here. Some kind of separator with, with a, a liquid electrolyte that allows the lithium ions to pass through here, but it doesn't, it doesn't transport electrons. So the electron, the only way the electrons can transport is through some external circuit path, a conductor. Okay, and I had this circuit open initially, and then I closed it, and I closed that circuit with some load, with a motor, for example, then current flows and the motor operates, the motor spins, and that's how you convert the electrical, stored electrical energy into to mechanical energy. On the other hand, if you uh, reverse the reaction, if, you, if that yellow ball was a, a power source, a, a, a current source that could force the, force the electrons in the other direction, that would also force the lithium ions in the other direction, and you would put energy into that configuration. Okay, so that's a way to store energy. And uh, here's a Here's a graphic of that happening. I can get this, get this going here. Oh yeah, here it goes. There we go. Oh yeah. Okay, so this is a. This is magnified billions and billions of times. <laughs> so it's really thin layers of these things. But uh, here's the cobalt side. Here's the graphite side. And there it is charging up. And now here it is discharging and you're driving. This is when you're driving. And then the other side is when you're, when you're, when you're charging up. So that's, that's basically how it works. The, uh, it's not really too complicated to, to set up. If you, if you build this right, it's very stable. And you can do that for many cycles. Now, thousands of cycles is no problem for these kinds of batteries, these cells. One cell is only worth about three, three and a half volts. So you have to stack them up to get that 400 volts that you need to, to run a good sized motor, but that's not a big deal either. Uh, the details are that you, 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 the chemists play around with what the electrolyte is to keep it stable and let it work well on a wide temperature range and also not burst into flames at bad times. <laughs> We've kind of got that figured out. Uh, modify the, the materials in the anode or the cathode to make it easier to manufacture or more affordable or use less, less material or pack more energy into a, a certain space as we'll talk about, but that's the basic idea. 
you still, at present, we still have to keep them at, at pretty reasonable temperatures, but this is still relatively new technology that's continuing to develop. Uh, I was able to see these batteries being made at LG Chem in Holland, which is really cool. And it's, a, it's, it's an interesting process. You just make, they just paint these, uh, the, the carbon uh, onto a copper foil, and, and they paint the uh, other stuff onto an aluminum foil, and they make a separator so that, the, that uh, that's permeable to the electrolyte but doesn't allow the cathode and the anode to actually physically touch. And then you just stack them up. Stack them up as many as you can to get a lot of surface area. The more surface area you have, the more capacity it has. Squeeze it together. Either you roll it up into a cylinder. That's sort of the typical battery configuration we used to know about, C cells and D cells. Or you, you make it into a flat prismatic type. It doesn't really matter to the, to the chemistry or the, the structure of it because it's what happens is on such a small scale. But they're basically the same. They pump out all the air, seal it up so it's, it's well contained. Uh, it's kind of cool. When you get done with that, you've got things that either look like this, or like this, uh, or like this. Uh, this is kind of what the battery cells in my car look like. And then they're in another bigger box. Uh, this, this one here, uh, just for size, like, I don't know, where I, like this big, yeah. yeah, like this big, yeah, so, and, and kind of thin. Okay, so what do you need? Why do you need that energy? Well, you get from point A to point B, if you stop, if you're not moving, you need to get moving, okay? And physicists understand that in order to get something that has mass moving, it requires energy. We call the energy when it's moving, the energy that it has, we call that kinetic energy. And the amount of energy that something moving has is proportional to the mass it has. So that's mass m. And it's proportional to the square of how fast it's going. The, how fast it's going is that little v. So it's a pretty simple formula. Mat one half mass times the velocity squared for the amount of kinetic energy of any mass that's moving. That's if you get it moving on, on level ground. If you need to climb a hill, then you need some other kind of energy. And that kind of energy we call gravitational potential energy. Fancy name, but it's also, but it's also proportional to mass. And, and this is not surprising. If you want to push something up the hill, it's going to take more energy if it's heavier, right? It's got more mass. So gravitational potential energy is also proportional to the mass m. It's proportional to the constant g, which Depends on what planet you're on, okay, and how high you want to raise it. Pretty simple. Once you get going, if you uh, if you had if you're like on a very smooth ice surface, uh, you wouldn't need to keep adding energy; it would keep going, right? Uh, we don't want to usually drive on ice, so we usually have some friction, and we also have uh, uh, air drag at the speeds we're talking about. So additional energy is required to uh, continue traveling at a constant speed. But that's usually actually much less than the energy required to get up to speed or to climb hills. Okay, what's important is that, that the energy, most of the energy is, is proportional to how much mass you're moving. Okay, that's going to be important as we go forward. It's also going to be important, if we can, to try to keep separate in our minds the two ideas, two different ideas that are often confused in ordinary language, energy and power. They're very different things. Energy is the, an amount of some stuff, something. It's, it's not tangible, so it's a difficult concept. You can't always see the energy of different kinds, but it's, it's, a, it's an amount of stuff. And then power is the rate at which you're delivering that stuff or converting that stuff to a different form or or using it up, or something like that. So power is a rate. So power would be energy divided by time, energy per time. If you turn that around, you can get, you can multiply power by time and get energy, and we'll have occasion to do that.
Proper scientific units for power are watts, not horsepower. I'll give you the conversion, but watt is the better unit. But watt is a, unfortunately a very small unit, a very small amount of power, a very small rate, one watt. It's kind of puny. So we have kilos. We have a prefix. We can multiply that, at, that by a thousand and just put a little, put a little letter K in front, and we have a thousand of those. So that's a little better. <coughs> that's what a kilowatt is. <coughs> and then this is where it starts to drive uh, physicists crazy. Uh, joule is a perfectly good unit for energy, but it's also pretty small. So in common practice, especially with electricity, instead of just using megajoules, which we could use, we take the kilowatts and we multiply them by hours, and that gets us back to an energy unit. Okay, but that makes for all kinds of confusion, especially in my classes, because people see kilowatts and they see kilowatt hours, and they think, well, they're, they're basically the same, but they're different. Okay, so trust me that they're different. I'll try to make sure that I don't confuse. Okay, so a kilowatt hour. <coughs> Even though it's got a kilowatt in it, a kilowatt hour, a kWh, is an energy unit. All right, here's my conversion I say, talking about. For it's very close to uh, three quarters of a kilowatt gives you a horsepower. If you're a car person and want to relate it to horsepower, but I will not talk about horsepower. Right? Kilowatt hour is bad enough. Okay, so we have to store energy, and then we have to convert that energy to the form that we want to use it in. And any conversion of energy never converts all of the energy that you have into the form you want. There's always some inefficiency, or another way of saying that is efficiency is always less than 100 percent. So what I so the Best definition of efficiency is the fraction of the energy that you're converting that actually gets into the useful state. Efficiency is another one of those words that gets used improperly all the time. Um, I'll try to be careful about this also. And when we get to a later part of this talk, I'll be talking about a concept of fuel economy that's applied to, to, to cars. It's not the same as efficiency. Proper efficiency should have no dimensions of, it, of its own. It should just be a ratio. OK, so now to contrast with internal combustion. The reason internal combustion has been so great to us is because liquid fuels, this, this distilled product of ancient life that got trapped in the earth and processed over millions of years, is really good, a really good way to store energy. It has a lot of potential kinetic energy in a small volume and small mass. And it's easy to release that energy just by burning it, okay, by combustion. That's what combustion is. The penalties are that it's, it, the conversion to mechanical energy is not very efficient. You can never even get close to 100%. Uh, laws of thermodynamics force you to release some of that heat just into the, into the environment. It doesn't, uh, the energy, a big portion of the energy becomes heat. It doesn't become mechanical energy. Add to that the fact that in order to utilize combustion in a, in, a, in, a, in a car engine, they had to come up with this crazy thing, this reciprocating piston engine, where tiny explosions are happening in a chamber with a wall that can move. And valves are going up and down, and, and a fuel-air mixture comes in, and an exhaust goes out. And it, this was a big challenge. This is a crazy, I mean, it's amazing that it works as well as it does, at least to the physicists. It's, it, it, it is. I mean, it took, it took a lot of work. The engineering is, is a, it's a marvel of engineering. And it made it very reliable. I mean, in the early days, it wasn't so reliable. And you can understand. So many moving parts. This is just a fraction of what's required. You've got you to have a fuel injector or a carburetor or something to mix air and, and fuel in the proper, the proper ratio. You have have pumps and, and all kinds of exhaust and oh, you got all kinds of stuff. 
and, and cooling and lubrication. It's just amazing. And it's just, it's bizarre. But it works. Okay? In contrast, I brought this. This, and but, I, mean, I just brought it to make a few points. An electric motor is not a mysterious thing for people, right? But, but to set the scale and the contrast, this is half of an electric motor that was capable of operating a subcompact car. And I can pick it up, okay? And I can not only pick it up, I can hook it up to this a little lithium battery. And I can run it for you. Now, any, anybody who would want to demonstrate an internal combustion engine inside this room, they'd, they'd be crazy, right? Even if it was a small, even if it was a small uh, gas uh, power mower or a leaf blower engine, it'd be very obnoxious, right? You wouldn't like it. It would not be pleasant at all. I'm going to put a load on this so it doesn't spin out of control because this has, like I said, enough power to, to run a car with a bigger battery. But it's no problem. I got a little rheostat here and it's just fine. Okay, so that's to make a big, uh, to me that's an amazing contrast. Okay, so let's go back to efficiency. Here's a Sankey diagram of the energy in, in, from a typical, in a typical car, typical gasoline internal combustion car, okay, that we drive every day. And the idea is I'm starting over here with the energy in my fuel tank, and I'm just going to do this relative. So that is 100% of the energy in my fuel tank. And here is the combustion, internal combustion process, the auto cycle, 100 explosions per second happening. <laughs> And most of the energy that was in your gas tank it becomes heat that has to be ejected into the, into the surroundings. Uh, the specific numbers, they might vary depending on, on details, but the source of this is a lot of different studies that kind of agree on the, on the basic numbers. So 40% of that initial 100% energy that you had in your fuel tank is available now as mechanical energy, something spinning. But, uh, but there's a lot of friction. These pistons, they have to fit tight and then they have to slide. There's a lot of friction in the engine and it, it has, to pull the, has to pull gas and fuel in. It has to push the exhaust out. A lot of energy gets used for that. Not only that, but now we also have to operate the, the fuel pump, the water pump for, for cooling, uh, and an oil pump. And so there's some loss of energy there and it's not available, gonna be available for turning the wheels and moving yourself down the down the road. So now you're at the drivetrain. So now I've got a now I now because of the way this gasoline engine works, it's only really working well at one rate of spinning, one arc, one narrow range of RPMs. People know that if they're familiar with this. But that means you have to have a, a transmission with a variable, a way to change the gear ratio. That's your big transmission. That's another big hunk of things that I, I couldn't lift up and bring here either. Okay, so that, that has a lot of losses, mainly in the transmission. Now I'm going to penalize the gas engine because it's, it's kind of hard to get it started, and you don't want to turn it off and turn it on at every, every stoplight or stop sign, and so it's sitting there spinning and burning gas even when you're at the stoplight. We call that idling. How, how much are you idling? 3% of the time? Okay, I'm pulling that off here. So actually moving the car, that's I'm down to like 23% of the energy that I store. And now I'm going to also differentiate a loss to uh, friction in your brakes, slowing down. Now, why do I do that? Well, we'll see later why I do that. But I'm going to, I'm going to separate the amount of energy that you have. If you get your kinetic energy into the car moving, you have to remove that kinetic energy if you want to stop. What do you do with that kinetic energy? In the regular car, you make more heat out of it, right? Because you you just drag on a, on a rotor in your, in your brakes and you throw that energy away and then you get started again. Now to contrast that, if I can get energy stored in a battery, same, I try to make this the same width as this to indicate the same amount of energy stored in my EV. Now I'm going to use some of that energy right away 
to run whatever coolant pumps I have to, to run to keep things going, because I can use, that, use the electricity directly. Then I'm going to have this motor here and convert it to mechanical energy. That conversion can only be done at about 90% efficiency. That motor heats up a little bit, okay, so I'm dumping some heat there. But the rest is almost, almost all the rest is available to the drivetrain. There's no, there's no big transmission required. I don't need to change, if I properly design this motor, I don't need to change gear ratios. I get, get by with a lot less loss and get more of that energy into moving the car. That's, that's a nice thing. Okay, that means I don't, if I want to do the same amount of work, if I want to drive the same amount at the same speeds, I don't need to store that much energy. Okay, I could store this much energy. Yeah, I couldn't even quite get it this small, but roughly a fifth as much energy to do the same job once I get the energy into the car. Okay, so that's, that's good because what it takes to store the energy is much heavier than gasoline. Okay, and we saw that mass is important, so we have to worry about that. Okay, the amount of energy I can store in a battery of the same mass is much less than I can store that is available in the gasoline, a kilogram of gasoline. So the way to look at that is to use this quantity called specific energy. And if I compare specific energy of just the gasoline, the fuel tank mass is not that much. And the specific energy stored in today's lithium ion batteries there's, I'll do the math for you, it's a factor of 50. Okay, big factor. But I only needed a fifth as much energy, so I'm down to a factor of 10. Okay, I need 10 times more mass in batteries than I need mass in fuel to do the same job in my car. Now, I did save some mass here, right? Okay, so that helps. And I did save the mass of the transmission. So that helps, but this is still a uh, useful, uh, useful uh, estimates. Uh, get some actual numbers here. A gallon of gasoline, 6.3 pounds. Uh, that means if I wanted to have the same capacity as my fuel tank, a small fuel tank, a 12 or 13 gallon fuel tank, I need 800 pounds of battery. And that's that's the same mass whether it's empty or full, just, just incidentally. And uh, that extra mass means I actually need more energy to move the car. Remember what half mv squared and mgh? So it's even worse than that. Okay, so it's a good idea. Oops. I just did a little, I'll just illustrate this graphically for you. If we have battery mass here, and we have the range in which you're capable of going with that, that much battery, you might naively think that uh, I could have 75 mile range for 100 kilograms. Wouldn't I have 150 miles range with 200 kilograms? No, you wouldn't. You would add, you would, you would increase, you would double your range if it was the same efficiency, but you would have less efficiency, so you would, you would come down. Okay, this is this is just an empirical kind of rough model I made, but I, I based it on on some data of cars that were available then and now. Some some of the homemade cars in the past didn't even need to approach this, but but now Teslas and my Bolt are kind of I I just scaled this curve. I scaled my model to meet to match what, what's out there now, basically. So that's what that's based on. That's, so that's an approximate idea until the until the mass per until the energy per mass gets better until we get better batteries we can move that up but with current batteries that's kind of what you got to worry about but current batteries are a lot better than they used to be okay the old hundred hundred year old technology for storing energy in lead acid batteries here's the specific energy in watt hours per kilogram instead of kilowatt hours, but that's just a factor of a thousand. Uh, we have 
You might remember nickel cadmium batteries are still around, nickel metal hydride batteries. Here's the lithium batteries. They even had to modify this because they're getting better since the, uh, the uh, uh, graph was made by these people. But they're getting better, and it's, and it's pretty easy to see why, really. Uh, lead is here on the periodic table. Nickel is here. Lithium is here. And the higher you go, the less massive each molecule is. That's just a little size. So it's getting better. Probably still getting better. But this is what, a, if you want a, like two or 300 miles of range, something in the ballpark of a regular car, here's what a, the whole battery pack is going to look like. It's going to take up most uh, a lot of space, and it's going to be heavy. And here's how it fits into the Chevy Bolt, for example. There are different ways to do this, but this is a common way now. Put it low in the floor uh, that had a hump under the back seat to get some extra volume. Now, if I keep it centered, and it's not too obtrusive, it can be it can be packaged kind of nicely, and that's the way it's often done. As a physicist, I'm just naturally curious why in the world does gasoline have such a big advantage over the storage battery? So a physicist, it's all just chemical bonds. I mean, we, we, tend, to, we tend to look at the big picture, physicists, okay? We, we like the big picture. We, we only get into the details when we have to. So, so it's such a big difference. There must be something really really different and it's not it's not the, the nature of the where the energy is coming from it's all it's all stored in chemical bonds making and breaking chemical bonds and the the density of, of gasoline and, and, and lithium and cobalt they're not that different the big difference is that it's like a little chemical plant complete in this box it's not taking stuff out of the environment and dumping stuff it back into the environment. In a sense, the, the, the internal combustion engine process, the whole process is like a cheat, okay? It, it uses, it does a chemical reaction, but it takes a big bunch of its reactants from the air, and then it dumps a big bunch of products back out, okay? The, the battery, it's all there. It's all still there, before and after. All the chemicals that you use to do this are contained in that box before and after. Charging and recharging, discharging, it's all still there. So that's that kind of gives me a way to, to transition into some of the reasons we might not be so happy with internal combustion for all the great stuff it's done. So not only so it uses up that that petroleum, that, that oil, that stuff that took millions of years to make, you can't you can't grab those molecules back and make them back into petroleum or gasoline after you burn them. That's impractical. And then it dumps CO2 and high water vapor and other stuff into the atmosphere. A uh, thing that people don't always appreciate. The, the oxygen molecules that it uses and ties up with the carbon. The oxygen molecules are even more massive than the carbon molecules, the carbon atoms. And so each, each gallon of gasoline puts almost 20 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere when it burns. And now we've gotten to the point where there's so many cars driving so many miles using so many gallons of this fuel that we're actually making a difference in the atmosphere, as most of you probably know and appreciate. So that wasn't the case in the early days, but now it's something that we are really concerned about. Okay, so how much, how concerned are we about it? How, how much of a it's, both a, it's both a problem and an opportunity, right? If I just concentrate on passenger cars and light trucks, that's a big chunk of our, of our transportation, and it's a big chunk of the greenhouse gas emissions that the whole country emits year, year after year. So even if I only talk about the cars and light trucks, which, which, I, which now can be done electrically, 
we're talking about a significant chunk of our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we can't get rid of all of the greenhouse gas emissions by switching to electric, but we can, I'll show, take out a big portion of them, and so that's something to, to, to consider, to be interested in. Okay? Well, the reason we can't get rid of it all is because the energy has to come from somewhere. The electricity has to come from somewhere. Okay? There's no free lunch. We don't mine electricity. Okay? Right now, we generate electricity by burning other fossil fuels, at least in part. Coal and natural gas. Okay? Some are, some are better than gasoline, some are worse than gasoline. And, and you get that kind of that same thermodynamic penalty and efficiency that I talked about in, in the, the internal combustion engine, it's not as bad, okay, because the, the power plant could be, could be more efficient. So I'm going to try to illustrate that with these same things. This was, this was the car before, you recognize this, and now I'm going to change it to a power plant. Okay, so now it's a power plant, but instead of 40%, I can probably get 50% or maybe a little bit more into, uh, I can reduce the, the loss in, 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 in heat, <coughs> I can use that heat for other things, and then I get this gain of, then I get this advantage of using almost 90% of what I had, and so it's still better, it's still a better use. If you're going to have to have combustion to make the electricity, transmission losses aren't too bad in, in the grid, and you still end up using it more efficiently in, the, in an electric car than, and, and you end up putting out fewer greenhouse gases for every mile traveled in the electric car. That's if everything was, was combustion based. I should mention in passing that the power plant can control other pollutants better than, than billions of small combustion plants that are your cars, but uh, without getting into too much more of the weeds, the electric vehicle is better for air quality, it's better for uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions than just about any gasoline powered car if I don't talk about hybrids. Where the details of that vary depending on where you're located because where you're located then determines how right now how much of your electricity comes from coal how much comes from wind and how much comes from solar other things that don't involve combustion so it varies and I'm gonna I'm, I'm running out of time I'm running low on time so I won't spend time on this but uh, people have studied this and on the world on the U United States average uh, gasoline car would have to get 73 miles per gallon to be as the same greenhouse gas emissions as uh, an electric car, but it varies depending on where you are in the country. The other thing to keep in mind is that once you've got a gasoline car, you're stuck with gasoline. If you've got an electric car, you're not stuck with coal. We know that, that Utility companies are moving away from coal in this state and elsewhere, at least in this country. And over time, that means the, your climate impact from your electric vehicle actually goes down without changing your electric vehicle. Well, that's kind of cool. All right, so keeping with the practical theme, let me talk a little bit about the economics. It's one of the barriers, it has been one of the barriers to wider spread acceptance of electric vehicles. I mean, a lot of the barrier is inertia, but uh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, uh, costs. The initial cost is, is greater for an electric vehicle right now that does the same, basically the same job, the same capability as a gasoline powered vehicle. There are a number of reasons for that. It's a situation that will probably change, but on these other, most of these other things, you're going to save money. So if you talk about the whole lifetime of the car, you're actually going to uh, spend less money. You're going to spend less money on fuel. I'll talk about that. You're going to spend less, a lot less on maintenance because it's a much simpler 
a device machine. It doesn't have all those moving parts to wear out. It doesn't have a transmission. It doesn't have an exhaust system. It's simply simpler. It's going to be easier to, to maintain it. It's going to be cheap. And if we talk about externalized costs, the global, the global warming effect is smaller. The air pollution effect is smaller, even considering the, the generation of electricity. Um, this is a question mark because the, because the technology is changing so fast, these get a, an earlier model might become obsolete. And it's a little bit of a question mark how we're going to uh, recycle the materials and the batteries, but we'll probably, we'll probably figure that out. If you want to figure out for yourself what the fuel cost is, and if you're a homeowner or an apartment dweller, if you pay your own electric bill, you know that you pay for electricity by the kilowatt hour. Okay, so you can, if you're curious, you can look on your electric bill and see how much a kilowatt hour costs. And I can tell you that in a modern electric car, eight kilowatt hours, approximately eight kilowatt hours of energy from your from the plug in your house will do the same job as a gallon of gasoline in a, in a car. No matter if it's a big car, small car, this is a, this is a pretty good number. So most of us are paying, if you're re at a residential rate, about 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but if you're paying differently, then you, I mean, you can compare this. You can compare the, the fuel costs. Okay. I can go over a course, I apologize. But everybody wants to know about range, right? We do want to know about range, right? Okay. So range, what we call a range between charges and what you would call in a regular car fuel economy, they go hand in hand. We talk about fuel economy. Let me go get that up here. Fuel economy is how much energy it takes to go a certain distance. Basically, okay. It depends on a lot of things, but you can average these things out, and we're actually used to that in ter terms of miles per gallon for cars. So I'll, I'll show how that's how that's analogous. We're we're more worried about we're a little bit more worried about range in electric vehicles right now because there are there are fewer filling stations out there, but that's kind of a that's kind of that's at least 80% of false worry because, because at least in cities and towns and even rural areas in this country, electricity is everywhere. It's distributed, it's available, and, and you can plug in your car a lot of different places that aren't dedicated uh, uh, charging stations. Plus, you can charge at home, okay? And uh, the car, most people, the way most people use a car, it's sitting idle for half the day, right? So it's it's not it's not that big a deal if you have if your daily driving is less than the the range of your electric car, you don't have to worry about dedicated charging stations. It's only on long trips, okay? But, but long trips are important to some people, so we will continue to talk about range. Um, I said that, that fuel economy is how much energy is required to go a certain distance. If we use that measure, then smaller would be better, but we, like, we want bigger to be better because bigger is better, right? So we turn it around. We make it, we make it how much distance you can go divided by the energy that you have to use. And if we do that, then we have a nice analogy with, uh, with cars. Okay? so. It's good to have better fuel economy, I think. Okay? That's a big priority for me for a number of reasons. Okay? If you're worried about range, then for the same size battery, you can get more distance on it if you have better fuel economy. Uh, okay, you're paying for the fuel, so it's, it's cheaper to operate if you have better, better fuel economy, the way I've described it. So, so again, I have to swallow I have to swallow a little bit to talk about this unit. It's not only weird, it's a mixture of, uh, it's just a weird unit, but you don't have to worry about that. To make it 
to make it uh, easy for people to understand and useful. If you're already used to miles per gallon, we're just going to go to miles per kilowatt hour. Gallon of gasoline has a certain amount of energy, kilowatt hour is a certain amount of energy. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. And that's what the EPA is, is going to tell us. So hopefully the, the, the car manufacturers are going to tell us. So we're going to compare, we can compare the vehicles based on their miles per kilowatt hour. They actually do miles per gallon equivalent, that's, but hopefully they'll also do miles per kilowatt hour, because that even worse. <laughs> but at least you can compare different cars on that basis. But that's, you know, that's under some sort of average conditions. If you're really, if you're really driving the car, you want to know how a lot of these things affect how far you can go for a given amount of stored energy, because you only have so much stored energy, and it takes longer to, to recharge than it does to fill up at a gas station. So these are all factors. We're, we're, we're not surprised that if you're carrying more stuff, it's going to decrease your fuel economy, because that goes back to the mass that we talked about earlier on. But anything that increases friction, uh, all these things can affect your miles per gallon, or miles per kilowatt hour. So. City or highway? Highway. 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 All right. Why? No stopping. No stopping. No stopping. No stopping. No stopping. stopping no uses stop. energy. Stopping. That's pretty good. That's actually pretty good. Right. And it's it's so it, it, a lot of it is because of. Your friction brakes. Okay, I just quickly mentioned that before. But that's true. Okay, so it's surprising for the uh, physicist because the physicist knows, or other scientists know, that the faster you go, the more air drag you have. Okay, and the air drag is not, is not uh, linearly proportional. It's a big penalty for the air. So it should be the other way around. But for gasoline cars, it's not. And a lot of that is because of the friction brakes. Oh, that was, oops. So this is what all cars should look like. That's just that. Okay, so. So here is another kind of uh, model I made that gives you the miles per kilowatt hour as a function of speed in miles per hour. And so I took into account, uh, I took into account the air drag making feet, making it worse at higher speeds. But I also put in some constant friction, and then this turns over because of overhead. That means there's always some energy being used to keep the car on, even if it's not moving. So that's why it turns up, but that's not important. Here's what actually I observed with our car. So it doesn't quite follow that, but it does get worse uh, as you go faster. Uh, this is because while this is because there is some energy loss in changing speeds in the electric car, but not as much. And why is that? That's because of regenerative braking. This is one of the great things about electric, another one of the great things about electric cars is that this thing, this motor, can take electric energy and make it into mechanical energy, or if I use mechanical energy to spin this, it can make electrical energy. It can work backwards. It's properly designed, 
It works just as well backwards or forwards. So in the electric car, when it's moving down the road, even on a level road at a certain speed, if you want to slow down, you tell the computer, make that motor into a generator, and it'll take, it'll steal energy from your motion. It'll slow you down, and it'll put that energy, at least 90% of that energy, back into the battery for later use. You can't do that with, elect with a gasoline car. So that's why I penalized the gasoline car for the friction brakes on that earlier diagram. Okay, so, the other, so speed is one thing. The other thing that really, really affects the miles per kilowatt hour is uh, temperature. Okay, but it's mostly, it's mostly because the air outside gets denser 